Hello. You may or may not be aware that there is a case study floating across the interwebs wherein someone consumed Oreo cookies and reduced their blood cholesterol containing lipoproteins, usually called LDL for short, by a massive amount. Well, I had him on the podcast, which we'll be listening to shortly. But because I realize not everyone is familiar with this study, let me briefly explain the study design and the data so that when we get into the weeds in this episode, you'll be able to follow along. In short, this is a single person experiment wherein the participant noticed that they experience a sky high lipoprotein level from consuming a very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet. We're talking in the three, four, and even five hundreds range of total cholesterol and not far behind in LDL, which is the more commonly considered artery plaque forming type. So with some intuition that he'll get into in our discussion, he consumed 12 Oreo cookies per day for 16 days, and his cholesterol plummeted down extremely quickly. We can see that here. But for those that are listening on the podcast, I'll describe it. Uh, LDL levels drop by over 70%, over 200 points in just two weeks. Then he did a washout period, which means that he cut the Oreo cookies out for three months to return his lipoprotein back to this extremely high level. After the three months, he used a statin for six weeks. We can see that design here. For the podcast listeners, it's just a schematic of everything that I just explained, nothing new. And on the statin, as we can see by the data, listeners, the data shows an over 30% drop in lipoproteins from statin therapy. Now, clearly, Oreos outperform the statin in this context. So, why? Well, that's what we're going to be getting into. Now that I've explained the background of the study, allow me to introduce this uh, participant, Dr. Nicholas Norwitz. Nick already has his PhD and is currently in medical school working on his MD. Nick is one of the researchers working on this characterization of a phenotype or a trackable occurrence in people who consume a low carbohydrate diet and experience a sharp rise in LDL, a rise in HDL, and a downward swing in triglycerides, known as the uh, lean mass hyperresponder, which was, I believe, coined by Dave Feldman, who actually also joined in this discussion. But in this discussion, we focus on Nick's work because he was short on time. So, Nick goes into more detail on his case study, which is a fascinating listen. And then we get into another topic that I hold dear to my heart, and I believe both Nick and Dave do as well, which is poor science communication, which has several subplots to it from dishonest reporting to lazy reporting and much more. So you may hear me express a, eh, a bit of frustration later on. I do not apologize. Anyway, as a final word, this is part one of two, and anyone on podcast listening, fret not, you are listening to the episodes combined into one, so you don't need to do anything. If you're watching, I will release part two focused on Dave Feldman's work in the very near future. Let's begin. Okay, uh, well, thanks for joining, guys, although we've been talking for the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so... Nick, Dave, do you guys uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, just kind of talk a little bit about your background, uh, your interests in in relation to our general topic of discussion and things of that nature. Just wherever the wind takes you. Uh, I am Dave Feldman, obsessive OCD engineer who <laughs> uh, saw his cholesterol skyrocket, became completely uh, engrossed in trying to understand lipidology, found out that it looked a lot like a uh, network. You can really see a lot of this backstory in other podcasts, but I got to be honest, I'm super excited to chat with you, Nick, and get into the mechanisms and theory uh, behind it. But probably the most relevant piece of information in the present that I'm excited to be chatting with you about is our doing the research on the major phenotype of interest that we're focusing on, which is lean mass hyperresponders. And uh, speaking of lean mass hyperresponders, I'll hand it off to Nick Norwitz. Hi, my name is Nick Norwitz. I um, 
am currently a medical student at Harvard Medical School. Before that, I did my um, uh, graduate degree, my PhD at Oxford University in Metabolism. And similar to Dave and many other lean mass hyperresponders, I went um, low carb keto for therapeutic purposes. For me, it was inflammatory bowel disease, which was really the only thing that put that condition into um, biopsy proven remission, actually, and really gave me my life back. But to my surprise, and this is well before I met Dave, my LDL like skyrocketed. And when I say skyrocketed, I meant it was well below 100 and it ended up going above 500. And the interesting thing about me, I'll put this up front, um, and the thing that had me scratching my head is when I went keto, the way I thought at the time was the healthy way to do it was very like Mediterranean-esque. So I wasn't eating any red meat, basically none, um, or dairy. It was actually a very low saturated fat diet. And nevertheless, I had this response. And um, I started doing my own digging, and one thing led to another. My world collided with Dave, and for the past couple of years, we've been researching this topic of lean mass hyperresponders, trying to figure out why in some people LDL skyrockets, what's causing it, and what we can learn about that to apply to like human medicine, but just basic science understanding and understanding of metabolism. So for me, as a medical trainee, there's definitely an important clinical element here. And we're going to talk, I'm sure, in this discussion about appropriate messaging, safe messaging around this topic. And then for me as a scientist, this is the kind of thing where you're like, whoa, what's going on? And uh, there's a shock and awe element that just keeps me engrossed and coming back and wanting to learn more about this topic. So it's been a really exciting journey. And I couldn't be more grateful for the friends I've made along the way, including Dave and maybe a new friend today, a friend with an awesome name, by the way. So um, thanks for having us on, Nick. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. Uh, although I was gonna, I was gonna joke with you that adding a K to your to your uh, to the uh, to the abbreviation of your name, I just can't get behind it. <laughs> but uh, I, I agree with you on on all all the fronts that you mentioned, especially the the part of uh, scientific interest in in this topic. I think actually I watched uh, one of your videos relatively recently where you said that I think it was another interview with uh, both of you guys where. Uh, Nick, you had mentioned that it seems it it just seems like this is the the perfect landscape for a scientist to just get extremely excited and just uh, curious about this phenomenon. And I agree. I I think that it should be discussed a lot more because um, initially when I first ran into it, I did I didn't know anything about it obviously and then I, I started delving into both your guys's content and uh getting into reading the studies that you guys have put out so far uh the lem model and all that stuff um and it's it's wildly interesting so i'm i'm hoping that it catches on in terms of pe people's interests but especially scientists interests um to to hopefully get to some answers and, and start getting into some of the nuances that we'll be getting into it in this discussion as well um so, yeah, actually, uh, Nick, I know that uh, recently there's been this uh, study, this case study that uh, you've been a heavy-handed uh, participant in. <laughs> I was curious if you could talk a little bit about this uh, this Oreo study, and uh, yeah, just kind of uh, walk us through the Oreo study and and what it means. Yeah. So to kind of st take a step back and frame why I did this in the first place. People watching this might even know, I'll, I'll just kind of not bury the lead. I did a study where I tested our model by seeing if I could lower my cholesterol, my LDL bad cholesterol with freaking Oreo cookies. That's not like a, a euphemism for something. I literally mean eating a sleeve of Oreo cookies in addition to my diet and then compare it to standard of care, high intensity statin therapy. And lo and behold, the Oreos outperformed the statin as predicted by our model. It seems kind of ridiculous, but to frame it up a little bit, and like we were saying, this is something that is wildly interesting. And for me as a scientist and as an educator, something that is a special challenge, but a challenge that's one of my favorite in the world is to figure out how I can translate the shock and awe and passion I have for science to a general audience. Because when I see lean mass hyperresponders and study the physiology, my mouth just opens, my jaw drops, and I get engrossed. Now, how do you make the average person turn their head and go, whoa, that's cool. I want to learn more. Oreo versus statin seemed like a reasonable approach, but there's a little more to it than that. In that um, 
we've been putting blood, sweat, and tears, our own and participants, into studying this topic. I think it's wildly important for the advancement of science and for, you know, um, appropriately treating these patients whose physiology really isn't well understood. So we have paper after paper coming out. Our most recent one prior to the Oreo versus statin paper, which is admittedly an N equals one, so it's not proving anything, but the study right prior to that was a meta-analysis of 41 randomized control trials, also consistent with the lipid energy model, which was published in a top nutrition journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I think it should have been a, you know, uh, a nuclear bomb for uh, science and in, in metabolism, but there wasn't so much talk about it. In fact, there hasn't been that much talk about the research we've been doing. Um, and obviously I have my bias and every scientist I'm sure has some sort of grandiose perspective on their literature, but nevertheless, I do feel, and I can support this if we want to get into specific examples that there is, um, a particular set of obstacles that we have to overcome on the topic of our research because it abuts against something that is unfortunately quite political, which has to do with LDL cholesterol and heart disease. So uh, for us, it's been really hard to get the conversation started. You know, we have some social media presence, Dave and I, Dave even more than myself, but we're not huge influencers with huge media outlets, you know, and we're not getting invited presently to like Rogan or Huberman. Maybe that will change in time, but like, we don't have a massive platform, um, but what we, nor do we have massive resources to do multi-million dollar studies. So we like to get creative. And for me, Oreo versus statin was me feeling quite honestly, maybe I'm just an impatient 20 something, but okay, this is, this is enough. You don't want to have this conversation. All right, screw it. I'm going to force this conversation by doing something dramatic. So I announced a priori on uh, Chris McCaskill Plant Chopper's um, YouTube that I was going to do this Oreo versus statin experiment. And it wasn't just like your average citizen scientist N equals one, not to diminish that, but I know how to dot my I's and cross my T's. I've been doing this for a little while. So I got an expert consultant lipidologist on board, Professor William Cromwell, who consulted. He's actually the guy that trained Thomas Spring, for those listening, uh, who trained Peter Atia. And he was consulting. My um, primary care physician was ordering all the tests. I had an IRB exemption from my institution. I announced this a priori, what the protocol was and why the protocol was the way it was. And then I carried out the experiment and published the results like I said I would. So I did this as in above board a manner as I could. And the prediction was, and we'll get into the lipid energy model, but the, the idea is in lean people when you go low carb, your LDL goes up as a um, metabolic, an adaptive metabolic response to energy needs. You're not, you know, you don't have carbs on board in your liver to send out to your body. So you start sending more fat out in the form of these VLDL particles, which then become LDL. So 50,000 foot view again, if the driving force is depletion of liver glycogen stores, putting glycogen, glucose back in the liver should remove the driving force for the high LDL. Now, we've actually done this before. Here's the thing, why I was pretty confident. We have an interventional trial by Cooper et al. and a case series in our first paper showing adding back carbs does work. But these didn't catch on. One, maybe because it was probably more of a carb swap. So you could argue, okay, the fat was reduced in the diet, and maybe that has something to do with it. But also because they were healthy carbs. So when people say, why do you use Oreos? Why don't you use a sweet potato? I was like, well, we've done that. We've used the sweet potato. Patients have used bananas. I've talked to patients and they're like, I like mango. I'm like, it's a freaking mango. mango. And then their LDL goes down. But it didn't catch on. So I'm like, all right. Like I said, I want to force a conversation. Carb quality really shouldn't matter according to the model. So I'm going to lower my cholesterol with the most provocative food that I could think of. What is the, the typical, it's a canonical unhealthy carb that is branded that everybody knows. And I thought Oreo cookies. And then I thought it would be a good idea to compare it to statins because you want some sort of comparator. So I did a crossover trial where I ate Oreo cookies, 12 cookies per day for 100 grams of carbs for 16 days. Did a washout period to return to my baseline body comp and uh, high cholesterol levels. And then tried a statin therapy for six weeks, um, tw um, 20 megs of resuvastatin. And the Oreos lowered my LDL by 273 milligrams per deciliter, a 71% drop. 
from its baseline versus the statin, which only reduced my LDL by a 32.5% drop. So those are the results. And the point of Oreo versus statin, like I said, was to get people to turn their heads and start asking questions. Say, this is interesting, nothing more than that. And we're very careful about the messaging around it, at least we are. And in the paper, in the graphical abstract, the video abstract, the conclusions, we're saying, look, you know, it shouldn't need to be said, but we're not recommending Oreos for health, nor are we saying statins are ineffective. They actually had the expected effect. It's just that Oreos were more effective in this, and we use this term, particular metabolic context. This is a metabolic demonstration. Now, I think any human adult should probably be able to figure out I'm not recommending Oreos or that Oreos aren't a health food, even if I were recommending them. But again, it was an interest piece to get people to turn their heads and start looking at this literature and talking about it. And to some extent, I know I'm playing with fire or I was and that people will try to turn the narrative in different directions. But I think overall, what it did for us, and Dave, you can chime in with your two cents and Nick with yours as well, but it amplified the visibility of this work overall, therefore achieving its aims, and has given us an opportunity to have some really fantastic conversations with more people, including this conversation here and now. So that's my long elevator pitch. I would like to add to that, to really set this stage, that Nick ended up doing this experiment and completing it on the heels of an enormous number of papers that Nick was very central to helping us publish. So it would be one thing if this was done three years ago. Rather, it's done, in fact, literally on the heels of a, a meta-analysis of 41 RCTs, which I know you've had a chance to look at, Nick. It kind of sucks for me as the guest that I'm gonna keep like pointing <laughs> to each different Nick, but uh, it, it's, it's extremely relevant because not only do we have all of those published papers, but Nick Norwitz is also a lead author on an editorial, which I'm betting you've probably read, Nick V, <laughs> um, where he uh, is, is getting together a number of other luminary authors to discuss the relevance and um, uh, the push towards considering lipid lowering, steps towards lipid lowering for those who are lean mass hyperresponders. So I really want to emphasize this succession. His Oreo experiment takes place after these things are actually published and in the literature. So I don't, I don't think there could have been much more of an overt messaging process that I think was extremely responsible to then on the heels have this very provocative experiment that I think Nick executed well, and that I'm very excited uh, helped to showcase our model. Yeah, I see. Uh, I see what you mean. Um, just a just a quick question about the, uh, the case study. You said that there was Nick. You said that there was a, a washout period. Um, mm -hmm. How long was the washout period? Three months. Three months. Okay, so really long. I mean, that's 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 a great one. Um, yeah. So taking the data. So you touched on it a little bit, Nick. Uh, taking that data from from this case study. How would you interpret these results and talk a little bit about uh, the nuances of how to interpret results just kind of as a whole? What I would say is that nobody is trying to prove anything from a case study. That's just a rule. Case studies are generally written on what are perceived to be outliers or new findings to provoke interest to push further research. That's just a rule in science, no matter what medical case it is, that's what a case study is for. Um, in this particular case, what I would point out to people is this is a bizarre finding, but unlike a lot of other case series that are, or case studies that are retrospective, like if you're in the hospital, if you're a physician or a resident, um, physician, whatever, and you see a weird case, then sometimes you go and post hoc write it up. Like this was an interesting thing that we observed and we want to share it. This wasn't that. This was a case study experiment that I announced beforehand. So put yourself in my shoes. I predicted this would happen and then did it. It wasn't like some cherry picked random example. And it was based on, the prediction was based on a model that we've put out there 
on which we are soliciting and have been soliciting criticisms, we really haven't had, I think, a challenging model present itself from the entire lipidology community. And we have other interventional level and um, other case series level data that are perfectly consistent with the model and that would also predict this outcome. So what I would say is that based on that, I think it's fair to presume, hypothesize, whatever soft language you want to use, that this would probably be replicatable in other lean mass hyperresponders as a population. At what point you need to ask why? The thing about Oreo versus statin is it draws an uncomfortable tension that is patently obvious, which is bad intervention, bad intervention, Oreos, good outcome, drop an LDL. And so what you need to grapple with is how can I, to- Can I quick uh, interject here just for a second? Because yeah. anybody who's listening, I just want to point out, just to make the, your point abundantly clear. Uh, Nick put quotations around good uh, for LDL and uh, bad for for Oreos, just so that everybody's clear yeah. on the, the kind of subliminal joke behind that. Well, the, the point being is that people want to put um, quality judgments on any outcome um, or any paper or like to jump to conclusions about how is this relevant to me right now? I think it's a natural human response. And in 2024, with people's generally short attention spans and the way media is spun, that's what people are always looking for. And so they jump to conclusions that might not necessarily be there. And what I say again and again is inspect those emotions. Why are you uncomfortable sitting with this uncomfortable tension? This presumed to be bad intervention, Oreos, has a presumed to be good outcome, lowered LDL. So how do we reconcile that? And that's it. That's the point. That's the question that I need you to grapple with as anybody that's interested in science. I'm not here to tell you the answer per se. I'm not here to say anything about high LDL and whether it's safe or not safe in this context, nor am I here to say anything about statins. And I think we can all presume that Oreos aren't a health food. But then you have to think, what is the most reasonable way to reconcile these uncomfortable findings? And something I've said a few times now, and I'll say it again, is I think the point of science is not to shy away from uncomfortable questions, but to embrace them. And so what it presents is a very clear uncomfortable question that we need to address together. And I think there are already some answers, like Dave said, existing in the literature, in our literature, that we want people to come and expect. That said, the body of literature clearly isn't complete. And what we need is resources to do more rigorous trials to evolve the model we don't have those resources and we need to collaborate to get them. Increasing visibility helps us to acquire those resources. So it was a strategic play, um, not one meant to, you know, comment at all on safety or lack thereof of um, high LDL or, you know, the value of statins in general clinical care. And we say that again and again and again. And um, what I find there's the expected responses of people with pre-existing, you know, um, thought processes who are going to engage in confirmation bias and spin this a particular way. We know that's going to be the case. I don't think anybody was convinced Oreos are a health food or that statins are bad because of the study. I truly don't. If you can find a single example of where that's a bona fide case, I'd be interested to inspect it. But I think more to the point, there are people with pre-existing positions. Um, and then on the other side, I know there are people that are going to try to discredit this work by, and we have people doing this at this point in time, we can talk about it. Lane Norton recently dropped a video that we can discuss, but who are going to try to pretend our positions are something that they aren't. And um, like Dave said, I think we're very clear on our messaging. We're very happy to collaborate and we've done so with our critics in the past. I think it's something we take a good amount of pride in. So with something like this, this was somewhat of a, a social experiment for me. I've never done this before. I don't know anybody who's done something quite like this before. Um, but it's me playing with the tool set that I have at my disposal to amplify and push forward our research. And we'll see how it goes. It's an evolving story. But I will just say I have been really heartened by the discussions we've been able to have with people you know, who might 
I'm not even going to say have different points of view on the role of LDL and atherosclerosis. I'm going to say perceived to have different points of view, including yourself or including people like you might have seen. I went to Walter Willett's house and had a discussion. I think a lot of people would think that me and Professor Willett have very different points of view and perspectives and clash. Quite frankly, I think when you sit down with reasonable scientists with, you know, different backgrounds, it's just fodder for a great discussion provided both parties are open-minded. So it's been a lot of fun and I think it's had a positive effect overall. My two cents. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, again, I agree. Um, how do you Can think the elephant in the room that yeah, the elephant please. that we kind of stepped around was saturated fat? Uh, I had done an experiment five years ago that had similarities in that I had consumed white bread and processed lean meat coming off of a ketogenic diet, and it had dramatically lowered LDL. But in critiquing self-deprecatingly to my experiment in a way that I think Nick Norwitz had improved on substantially is it could be argued that perhaps my LDL had gone down due to my shifting from a high saturated fat diet in my ketogenic context to this white bread and processed meat. Same scenario in that I was trying to intentionally choose something that wouldn't be considered health food. But Nick improved on it in many ways, and, and especially with regard to the Oreos were both much more brand name recognition and as an addition, actually there's a little bit of saturated fat in Oreos. So adding it on top of his already Mediterranean style ketogenic diet, which already wasn't that high in saturated fat, in spite of his very high starting LDL, you see this huge plummet without there being a reduction in saturated fat, with there actually being an increase, a small increase in saturated fat. And so I think that in addition to what you've probably seen with the other papers that we published, I think it really starts to draw special interest is to this context of whether or not the higher LDL in folks like us who are going ketogenic or metabolically healthy and who see this higher level of LDL, whether or not that's predominantly due to saturated fat, which I think we've provided lots of data uh, to suggest otherwise, and which is why I especially love this Oreo versus statin experiment, because I think it, it went toward that directly. You guys have uh, you guys have mentioned saturated fat, and you've guys also, have also mentioned this meta analysis that you guys put out, um, which it, therein you guys discuss saturated fat as well, and you show that there is a slight increase in LDL with saturated fat intake as a whole, but it doesn't explain this massive spike in in this example LDL. Um, so. And Nick, I think you, you'd also mentioned that this also happens when you don't consume saturated fat, so it can happen from the consumption of unsaturated fat. Yeah. My highest LDL I actually documented when my um, fat intake was the ratio saturated to unsaturated was 1 to 5.7. So 15% saturated to 85% unsaturated was my highest LDL ever, which was a 545. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's consistent with what we see in the literature, including this meta-analysis of RCTs. Now, we've never said that saturated fat can't impact LDL, especially in the general population. But it's often, it's a very easy scapegoat when people say, oh, the LDL is 300, 400. Oh, it's the saturated fat. And then saturated fat and saturated fat rich, rich foods get vilified, which is just bad science. Even just starting at the very, very basic level of magnitude of effect. I have not seen anything in the literature to suggest that, you know, eating some butter, eggs, and beef can move your LDL from 95 to 500, even if we're just talking about ma magnitude effect. So I think we should all be interested in what is the source of heterogeneity with respect to increases in LDL on low-carb diets. If for no other reason, then that remains a major obstacle in the clinical implementation of these diets for various use cases, from epilepsy to mental health disorders to kidney disease, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is just about scientific integrity and deep thought processes. Um, if somebody wants to eat, like me, a lower saturated fat diet, all things being equal, then fine. And also, people tend to ask why I eat a lower saturated fat diet. The most honest answer is I just love fish and olive oil. It's a taste preference thing. 
more than anything else. Um, but you know, that is hmm? he has quite a collection of olive oil bottles, just like lines the top of his, uh, his cupboards. It's quite, it's quite astonishing anyway. But, um, <laughs> yeah, point being it's the, it's the BMI more so than the butter lower BMI that's increasing LDL and low carb diets. In fact, when we see people with obesity, particularly class two obesity, go low carb, even when they eat high saturated fat diets, their LDL tends to go down. So again, it's just about proper science and, um, you know, not vilifying the wrong topic. If you want to vilify the, something for high LDL, vilify the six pack and we ha can have discussions about <clears throat> what the actual, actual implications therein are. But I think we're having like kind of a couple discussions that fold over on themselves. One is mechanistic. And then the other is with respect to risk. And I do as much as possible like to separate them because I think it allows us to more objectively analyze the science and explore the scientific enthusiasm around what is a very interesting topic, what is interesting phenomena, and then separately have a discussion about, okay, what do we know about this and how it might relate to risk and what do we have to explore further? Because sometimes I feel like, actually, I'm very confident that this is the case. People don't want to talk about lean mass hyperresponders and the lipid energy model because they feel discussing the mechanism gives license to the high LDL or makes people feel like they have license. And those are two different things, discussing mechanism from a scientific point of view and then discussing risk management on a individual patient level. I'm also going to move because my face in the video is like a ghost on this lighting. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to find a new location. I get I get I'll, that critique often. <laughs> I'll add that I probably um and this is where this is where Nick and I are the our Venn diagrams are nearly overlapping perfectly. I'm probably more of an unknownist in some cases because I'm not charged with the situation of being a clinician or a future clinician. Uh, in that regard, I don't feel the same need to um, even imply advice in some fashion. And so I actually take steps. I'm sure you've, you've seen uh, Nick V that I take steps regularly to say, look, I'm just a curiosity machine trying to gather information, but please don't take anything I'm saying as medical advice or even nudging you in one direction of medical advice. And to that extent, uh, I, too, want to keep these two topics separated, mainly not because I don't think one will have implications on the other, because I do. I think that if the lipid energy model is, as I believe it to be, it may have some implications. And I know you and I will get a chance to chat about that more in its relevance, potentially with atherosclerosis. But this is one of the difficulties that I kind of want to really clear the air on. I feel as though in social media... A lot of well-intentioned folks on both quote-unquote sides of the lipid hypothesis aren't engaging other people on the other side who want to have a nuanced conversation. Unfortunately, I feel as though there's this sort of default practice. Again, I don't think it's even that conscious for many people who do it to find those folks, or for that matter, those folks are put in front of them by other people who um, are the extremists. So instead of somebody with a nuanced educated position, engaging those with other nuanced educated positions who have differing opinions, they instead get too much face time or see too often those people with a more extreme simplified position, and then they feel a greater urgency to attack that and tackle it. And that's kind of a problem because then what happens is, is even when we're putting together the hard work of doing the research and getting it out there and doing our best to message it as best as we can, what often happens, and unfortunately it's kind of happened a bit this week between two different uh, people in the space, is that they kind of approach our research, not fully, but then when putting out their own analysis seem to be drawing attention to those extremists that are not us. And it seems to detract from that greater engagement of the nuance we're trying to promote directly. So uh, I wanted to pay you a compliment in that I've 
been putting in a bit more time on reviewing your videos and your materials. First of all, I think you do such an excellent job of breaking down um, the lipid system and especially atherosclerosis. Uh, so props, it actually was something that really motivated me to, to keep watching more videos. But on top of that, I think you may be one of the few that I'm hoping we can count on to be curious enough to really understand mechanistically what we're talking about and to remain engaged in it, uh, as opposed to kind of defaulting back to that position of attacking those who are the extremists who aren't fully ingesting and understanding what we're saying. That's that's what I'm hoping for. Oh, I, I, I can. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, secondly, uh, yeah, you can definitely count on me for that. I, honestly, I think, Nick, uh, when you were describing certain aspects of how you think about the physiology, uh, you had this moment where you kind of look to the side and you're like, whoa, I'd, I'd love to learn more about that. Um, I, I have that experience on a daily basis, so I, I resonate with that, but it ties into what Dave is saying in, in that uh, I, I become obsessive. I can't if I don't know something, I have to know. And I, I can't eat. I have trouble sleeping. It's It, it kind of consumes me. So something like this, uh, some massive uh, piece of data or multiple pieces of data from, from LMHR, I certainly couldn't ignore it. And I, I won't be able to ignore it. So uh, rest assured... <laughs> rest assured i will be i'll be keeping track of things and i'll be staying in, in communication to to keep uh to keep getting to the bottom of things look ultimately i don't know if we'll, we'll end up seeing exactly eye to eye 100 percent, but i i'm certainly not going to be ignoring any any of the data that's going to be coming out of uh, out of your work by by any means but i, I want to actually emphasize that's exactly what we're looking for like we're always trying to reach out to people with different points of view and get genuine open-minded feedback. That's actually a huge difficulty. And when we can find those opportunities, we tend to jump at them. So for example, I think of our, I don't know what, eight papers now, the most, I'd say the number one most ignored one is the editorial and the journal of clinical lipidology. But to talk about it just for a moment, that spun out of after we had our first paper, we thought our messaging was pretty responsible, but a a, pers a physician on Twitter, Michael Mindrum, who has given some pushback in the past, gave us some criticisms. Now, I think we were pretty careful about our wording, but we were willing to not only hear him out, but then it was a great opportunity to collaborate with him, me first author, him second, and a bunch of other expert physicians, including Ronald Krauss, who um, P Peter Atia suggested I reach out to, to then do an editorial about the need to research this topic as scientists, but also convey clinical caution responsibly. And it was a great opportunity for me to collaborate with people with a lot of different points of view. And we're always looking, for example, uh, opportunities like that, even with, I mentioned Lane Norton. Oreo versus Statin paper, I knew he'd have pushback. I knew he'd want to jump on the bandwagon if for no other reason than to get attention because he liked attention. I don't think he's going to deny that. So I sent an email on December 2nd, well before I submitted the paper saying, you want to look at this and actually give feedback, I will let you give feedback on the paper and acknowledge you in the acknowledgments. He didn't respond. He dropped the ball on that. But I point that out because, and I will say this now on the recording, so you have me saying it verbally to you, that you know I don't know what projects will be going forward. Often, if me and Dave aren't, you know, say, PI and not leading it, we don't have license on who we invite in. But for projects like Oreo versus Staten, not only just for optics, but I would genuinely be happy to send it by someone like you and get your feedback well before we publish. And if you make a substantial contribution, I'd love to co-author with you or people with different points of view. Like that's the where the best science comes from. So, you know, please do engage genuinely and give us pushback because that's exactly what we want. So how do you think about the... the th I mean, you guys have both touched on it at this point, but uh, you said that there are people on kind of bo both sides, quote unquote sides, uh, which is, as Dave said before we were on the recording, is, is really unfortunate that we have sides at this point. But um, I, I, by the way that we're discussing things, we're trying to slowly create those sides, try to blend the sides back together as opposed to, to creating more separation between the two. But um, for, for simplistic way of thinking about it, let's just say sides for the time being. Um, how do you think that people should be responsibly discussing your data and 
I guess, putting out information related to, to your data, as well as in combination with the data that's already out there on uh, really everything. I mean, from saturated fat to, to BMI's impact on this process. I mean, just as a whole, it seems like, it, it certainly seems from my conversations with Dave that you felt frustrated in the past with the the way that it's being displayed or or presented in certain instances. And yeah. I, I'd love to hear your take on what would be the more appropriate way to, to approach these things. I think this would also be really helpful for people that are listening or watching because they, I get this complaint all the time, and I'm sure you guys have gotten this as well, where people will say, well, one person's saying one thing, another person's saying something else. It's just like every, everybody's all over the place. So it'd be great to, to start to try to come to some sort of framework on, well, on how to, to approach these things. Let's start here. Literally okay. what we're doing right now. Like we, we're right now talking over the Internet. And, and we're fortunate to be in a day and age where a prominent critic on one side can connect literally within minutes if, you know, schedules provided. But even if, even if it can't be within minutes, it can be quite quickly. You can quite easily schedule a conversation to have. One pushback to doing that that often comes up and that I hear is that you might platform the person who you're trying to... Um, uh, push back on who you're trying to be critical of their work. But I always push back again on that and that that doesn't make any sense. If you believe that they are influencing a lot of folks and those folks that are being influenced could be potentially uh, harmed by it and they're willing to come on and be challenged by what you have to bring forward, then by all means platform and have that discussion because they already have a platform you're already being concerned by the degree with which they're having an impact on others. And if you if the conversation looks like it was productive, that it didn't, you know, fall apart and become very much, you know, a series of personal attacks. Like, for example, let's say Nick and I, every time we were chatting with people online, um, it, it was always about the personal and not at all about the data. And we were just proclaiming that our models were correct and that everyone's fine with having, uh, you know, high LDL, et cetera, that I think would be more of a reasonable understanding as to why some people might want to not have them have us on their platform because they would just assume that we're not going to engage intelligently with what those challenges are. But I feel we've, we've made every possible effort you can imagine that, that we can to try to have intelligent engagement on our research. And for that matter, to um, to reach out to these same folks who would like to do some analysis on our research, and especially if they're not getting it right, if they're not getting core tenets of, for example, the liberal energy model right, I myself, I would hope in their position, they would feel even more um, motivated to have us have this dialogue with them directly. Because it's not like the conversation ends there. It's it's not like one person's going to dunk on the other and then it's over. We're that much more interested in having these productive dialogues, and that's that's why this this right here is exactly what we need more of. I I have to really credit Nick in particular because during the little bit of a gap that he's had between being a second year <laughs> medical student and the rounds that he's been going in now. I have never seen anybody so engaged and selfishly. I love it because, of course, it's around this model and uh, discussing uh, lean mass hyperresponders, uh, and which is why there's so many interviews across so many spectrums. But he's been quite adamant about wanting to connect with Lane Norton, with um, Peter Atia, with many other people to see if he can get this conversation to help move this ball forward. So it's not like there's a lack between the two of us of an interest in trying to make this happen. What I would say on the topic of responsible discussion, um, I think Dave and I can speak to, again, for the sake of this discussion, we'll call them camps, our perceived camp. And as much as possible, when we're talking to other, um, let's say, keto or carnivore influencers, we make the point that but we're not trying we're not trying to say high LDL is safe. In fact, making that blanket claim 
I think is harmful to the work. And I say this again and again, particularly in Twitter spaces. I'm like, look, I know you might have a bone to pick, but please, for the sake of the research, don't say ridiculous, non-defensible things. Because what then happens is I get painted with that brush, and then it makes harder for me and Dave to do the research. So you're getting in our way. If you want this research to go forward, stop making hyperbolic statements. People do that, and people are going to continue to do that. So from our perspective, like, what do you do with that? Do you then just not pursue the research? And I think, no, people have their biases and they're going to look for confirmation bias. And if they can try to find it in our literature and try to twist it, they're going to do that. I don't think that's a reason not to do the work. And we clarify our positions again and again and again. So with respect to what's coming out of the keto camp, what I would just say is look for what Dave and I, and our close colleagues are actually saying. So if you want to accuse us of providing a message, find me the phrase in a tweet or the literature or even in a podcast where I say something to the effect of, and I'm not even going to say it right now because maybe it'll be taken out of context and that clip will be taken and then I'll regret that. But you know what I mean. You know what I'm going for. Come yeah, to well, us. Because we can public- I Go ahead. Can I expand on that, actually? Because this is a great example of where I course corrected over time. Because when I was first talking about this and my profile was lower, I would say I'm feeling optimistic about high LDL in this context of fat adaptation. And then I realized that people were too often just taking that as a categorical claim of certainty. And so I would say, okay, and I added the word cautious because I felt like cautious as a modifier would really emphasize that this is first of all, theoretical, and that there is potentially danger in my being wrong. So I'd say cautiously optimistic. Now, if you search my my social media, in the last two, three years, you can really see just this shift where I almost never use the term cautiously optimistic. And if anything, in almost every podcast, I try to further emphasize my lack of certainty. I try to like inject a line or something that I can say to further caveat it in the other direction. So I only mention this uh, right now. I only want to inject this because I think it could be fair if somebody were to go, you know, if I go back to 2017 Dave Feldman or 2018 Dave Feldman, he sounded more optimistic and therefore the messaging might um, have been a bit more potentially inductive. And I think that that would actually be a fair critique. I would, I would say, okay, how much though have I been in current days much more emphatic about the lack of certainty, especially as my profile has grown. And I don't feel that same level of latitude in being able to just discuss this theory openly. And to that extent, yeah, I'm actually quite proud of how we've messaged things, especially in like the last couple of years, as we're literally on the eve of getting these data with like lean mass hyperspotters and this association with plaque. So as you could understand, uh, Nick Norwitz, that's why I wanted to inject that part, because I think that would have been a fair point for some people to bring up. And I'll add an element here or a layer here, and this is going to be the more punchy pokey layer and where I actually think we have the biggest, um, let's say, source of what ends up being camps and controversy, which, yes, there are people who are keto who make extreme claims. But the problem I really have is with people who misrepresent our position in order to either try to discredit the research or more often than not with respect to the influencers, not the academics, get attention because it's a sport. Keto bashing is a sport. People love to watch it. And so people engage with that sport. So yeah, we'll return to the example of Lane Norton's recent video. He goes over again and again, oh, and the conclusions are problematic. There are these hot takes left, right, you know, and people saying this, that, and the other about Oreo versus statin. At no point in time does he go over what our conclusions are when it's been emphasized to him again and again. And in fact, I'm just looking back at the email now that I sent to Lane when I was inviting him to look at it. I said, my interest is in finding balance between drawing attention to certain areas of medical and scientific interest while also promoting nuanced discussion. Later on, I say, to that end, let me share some opinions I hold with which I suspect you may agree. For example, LDL particles, ApoB, are necessary for cardiovascular disease, yada, yada, yada. I'll also refer you to an editorial I wrote in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology on LMHR and risk, and an interview I had in the Plan Chompers vegan platform here, yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, 
after all that and, you know, clarifications left and right, including in the paper, the only conclusions he emphasizes are that the keto camp, the keto extremists are saying that, you know, it makes this proves statins are bad and high LDL, X, Y, and Z. Like he's very aware of what our positions are, but instead chooses to ignore them in favor of creating a caricature of the entire keto community. And what that does for us is it creates an obstacle because he has a massive platform bigger than ours combined. So then people assume that's our position when it's clearly not. And so the misunderstanding in that particular case stems from him. And then people on our camp get frustrated because he's kind of trying to kick us in a perverse way. So they come to our defense and then you end up with this like irritation and increasing polarization. So I think the caricaturization and the misrepresentations of the researchers positions or intentional avoidance of platforming and clarifying what are actually nuanced positions is a major and probably the most dangerous source of conflict. And so I call upon those who might put themselves in the camp of detractors to our work to actually have the conversation and see where we stand. Because I'd be pretty confident that the way things have rolled out, a lot of people that we haven't had the opportunity to have direct dialogues with, including, let's say, Thomas Dayspring or Peter Atia, have a misperception of our points of view, which probably align a lot more closely with theirs than they would otherwise think. And if they want to have a voice at the table and have a voice speaking to our audiences, we are offering that up on a silver platter. Uh, so one thing that in, in relation to, to what both of you have, have said is every interview that I have watched of you two or in isolation, you guys have always been extremely nuanced and have always put out exactly what you said. I've, I've always gotten the sense that you guys are trying to frame the conversation to what the data actually indicates. And I, I have immense respect for that. And um, that's a huge reason why I wanted to continue to have this conversation. Um, the Nick, what you're talking about on what some people would say in opposition of LMHR and uh, blowing things out of context and not taking your conclusions, which you actually wrote, which is actually something else I noticed, uh, for example, in the meta-analysis, you, you do specifically co contextualize what the results actually indicate. And you're not saying that LDL is necessarily not a cardiovascular risk factor or anything like that. You specifically point that out. And I, I, I do value that immensely. Um, on the other hand, at no fault to, to you guys, uh, because again, you guys always contextualize things extremely well and you're very eloquently spoken. There are some other interviews that I've seen where the, I feel like there are times when the interviewer is kind of skirting around particular questions just because they don't want to ask direct que questions that might lead into that more mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream idea of of LDL being a risk factor or, or atherosclerosis risk or et cetera, et cetera. And there, there are just times in, and they tend to be in this kind of uh, keto friendly environment where if I were in their shoes, I would ask a specific question or maybe probe a lot more in a particular direction um, as, and, and make sure that the guardrails, the context is strictly applied and, and repeatedly apply those guardrails because the audience is often then and sometimes you just can't avoid it i think nick you you mentioned that i mean there sometimes people would just no matter what they just see a little line or, or hear they sometimes they literally just hear whatever they want to hear and then they just run with it i mean you just can't avoid that but i think on on medical shows like people with with a doctorate if that's a phd or or an md I just don't feel like they 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 probe they they don't probe the way that they should be probing and the other aspect is that sometimes i genuinely feel like they're avoiding the questions that they should be asking and to your guys's credit is you guys always apply the context even though you're not being asked about the context 
And I genuinely, like, I have so much respect for you guys in, in that regard. Um, but I can understand Nick from, from the, from the opposite, again, I hate these camps, but let's say from the opposite standpoint, um, I can absolutely understand how somebody that's mischaracterizing, I love your, your use of, uh, using a caricature of the actual argument is, would be unbelievably frustrating. I mean, I get frustrated when people, uh, take my sentences and my words and you even joked about it that you did you didn't want to say something because it was somebody might clip that and, and then use that uh, later on i mean that's that i would be i'd be fuming and i'd be constantly fuming so i i i get some i have some empathy for 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 what you're talking about even though i'm not necessarily in the, uh, the in that particular research space so um i i hear you Thank you. It, it's happened to me a number of times, by the way. I, I've literally had to kind of train my brain a bit more to be mindful of something that could be said without. And oftentimes when I'm speaking extemporaneously, if I say something that in the moment I feel almost as if like there's a playback loop that's going on in my brain where I'm like, oh, that could be something somebody could just sort of take as is. I'll often have a follow-up statement to bring it back. I think this happened, for example, with a low carb Denver last year, you could probably find my talk online. And I think part of the issue was that I was genuinely, I was genuinely excited about the data that we were seeing yet at the same time, I wanted to present it responsibly, but even my exuberance and excitement I knew could be misinterpreted. And so I, as I'm presenting it, as I'm pointing out, that there was a lower than expected plaque volume, et cetera. I'm then immediately jumping in to say, but of course I wouldn't want anyone to take this one study, this one data point, et cetera, and to continue to work with their doctor, so on and so forth. And it, it's a challenge because interestingly, those on the prolipid hypothesis side who are still looking to be critics will continue to just move the goalposts and they'll say, oh, well, that's actually a dog whistle of some kind or something when it's like, I don't know how many interviews I can do and how many times I can say it with how many words I can say it with, but particularly people who know me in my life, they know that I'm much less certain. I, of course, I have some level of excitement that we really are onto something that may be truly novel data that may, and yes, I have said this many times and it is something I genuinely believe. I think we may be onto something that could teach us a lot about the, the, lipid metabolism in and of itself, separate from even discussing uh, the risk component side of it. But all of that said, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't get excited about and interested in this research without so many people watching so closely to try to read tea leaves into how this must be applied carte blanche categorically to the lipid hypothesis. And uh, that's that's the running challenge. It's you know it's almost kind of cathartic to have taken what we've taken almost an hour uh, discussing the messaging, in in that it's almost a capstone to this whole era of doing it. Because in the course of wanting to study this, what I underestimated at almost every step of the way, but don't do so anymore, is how emotionally charged the topic of cholesterol is. It is so much more inflammatory, no pun intended, than I ever expected because I come from a culture with engineers where we regularly discuss things that are completely outlandish. You wouldn't even want to know. You wouldn't even want to be a fly on the wall in the kinds of things that are debated and discussed in our in our dungeons of engineering. That it's just commonplace. I, I feel like in many ways, engineers can be especially good scientists because there already is such a detachment from the emotional components of a lot of these subjects. But that said, uh, it has, it's kind of trained me to be a lot more careful with the language that I use in discussing this. But to your point, Nick, we should be able to not only have these discussions, but if a keto host who has us on their podcast, you feel is not asking some of the deeper probing questions, that's exactly where we want to be places like here. You know, the questions that you have, the critiques that you have, we would love to hear them and we'd love to explore them. Yeah, which makes things infinitely more difficult when you have when you have those people that are not 
that are ignoring the the potential to have you guys on and actually have these good faith discussions. Uh, so I did have kind of a generalized question uh, for both of you. I was curious, what do you find most exciting about your research? <laughs> do we have another few hours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm one of the first things that I found exciting about it was my initial end of one experiments going back to 2015, 2016 was seeing just how fast. I mean, literally my second lipid test was 100 milligrams per deciliter difference in two weeks. Um, just to recall that real quick, because I, I know the exact dates. November 27, 2015 is when my date, when my world turned upside down because I'd gone ketogenic. And here I am seven and a half months later. And my LDL, which had been an average of 120, 130 most of my life, suddenly jumped to 240. And I, I, was, I was awestruck. And I became depressed and I couldn't focus on my work. And I was going to get a second test as a kind of a second opinion in case it was a lab error. And while waiting for that two week period to change, uh, to get my second test, I was, I, my appetite went way down. And so I kept thinking to myself, cause I didn't know anything about biochemistry, medicine, any of that. I thought, well, I guess I'm eating less fat and that's especially less saturated fat. So if I'm just straight up eating less fat and less saturated fat, and that's the real driver to the high levels of LDL, well, then I guess I'll, you know, see a drop or at least I won't see a change at all. But the last thing I should see is an increase. And then lo and behold, the December 9th test of 2015 is what changed everything for me because I did see an increase. My LDL jumped another 80 milligrams per deciliter up my total cholesterol jumped up another hundred and that set off a cascade of my end of one experiments, which I was more known for originally than the research that I'm doing now. Um, and that I organized a bunch of these end of one experiments. And that was the first and biggest, most exciting thing was just how rapid and fast these levels would change because every single person I was talking to doctor, scientists, et cetera, were like, no, it's mostly genetic. It's mostly like set points, but it definitely doesn't move very fast. You, you know, you take this medication or that, and those are maybe the ones that have the biggest change, but even then we should check back in a few months. And so I, I was like, no, actually it can really happen in a matter of days. And uh, since then I've been excited because there's been some experiments that I've done, for example, where I took my lipids six points in time over the day for 24 days. And I can, I can show how all the different lipids are changing just over the course of the day, especially if you're fat adapted uh, at levels that really altered my opinion on just how much you should care about that coming up to a lipid test in say three days, whether you're on a ketogenic diet or not, that's super exciting. The dynamism of the lipid metabolism is extremely exciting to me. <laughs> that's a great one. How about you, Nick? Well, I, Dave stole my word. I was going to say one word dynamism actually, but <laughs> Another way to, it. I have an analogy just to give uh, the same answer, but from a different angle, you know, like remember, um, the original Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire and he wakes up after being bitten by the spider and he's put on like 20 pounds of muscle mm -hmm. and he's just flexing in the mirror. Like what the heck happened? It's like, imagine if you could change your physiology in ways that like seem impossible. Like you could wake up tomorrow and have grown a foot and a half. Or tomorrow you bench, like let's say you, today you bench 150, tomorrow you bench like 400. Like it's just the weirdest thing. Your physiology can't change like that. Or people can't think your physiology can't change like that. Apply that to, you know, metabolism. That shock and awe, that dynamism. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's kind of what makes this so exciting for me. That, Like Dave said, people think this is something that moves like an iceberg but it really moves like a peregrine falcon. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you know, you can see I like superheroes, animals, you're getting a flavor of me. But point being, I think dynamism is a great word to wrap it together, that this is a dynamic system that we can manipulate in the coolest and curious, most curious of ways. I can lower my, like pause and think about the fact that, put yourself in my shoes. I figured out I can lower my cholesterol with Oreo cookies 
faster and more potently than any drug in existence. Like Repatha, I think has a 50% drop. That's the PCSK9 inhibitor injection. Like, you know, most potent drug you could have. I hit 71%. I didn't use Repatha, admittedly, so I don't know what that would do in myself. But point being, magnitude of effect and dynamism make this such an exciting space for someone interested in metabolic health. Yeah, yeah, I I completely concur. I think, uh, Dave, in your conversation with Dr. Cromwell, he, he even mentioned also that uh, that was uh, a remarkably interesting just the, the fact that things would change that quickly. He was, uh, he was initially pretty surprised. It, it was, ex it, it still is exciting every time I hear him recite the lipid energy model verbatim. So up mm -hmm. until now, it's been mainly, uh, myself, Nick and Adrian who can really kind of elucidate the lipid energy model end to end. And when, Bill was doing it and it, it was just a joy that he happened to be doing it in an interview I was having with him as opposed to me watching him in an, another interview, which happened later, by the way, because he's not a typical low carb cardiologist, like certainly Brett Shear might be fairly up on the lipid energy model, but he was describing it as a lipidologist would. He really was into the depths of describing, you know, the VLDL turnover being lipoprotein lipase uh, derived and I mean, end to end. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there and it's like a dopamine rush that I'm just like feeling throughout it because I'd been having this conversation with him for literally six, seven years. He was one of the first people who I'd been first talking about this with. And uh, again, I got to credit Nick's Oreo experiment because uh, I'm sure Nick, this wasn't in confidence when Bill brought this up to you and then you conveyed it to me, which is that he himself was starting from the saturated fat being the major lever of difference. And Nick pointed out, no, actually there wasn't a saturated fat change of a drop. And that helped to further light up the light bulb, um, for bill, which was just said which total was fat. I think he was thinking about, there's a total fat threshold. There was a moment we were on the phone and he's like, I think there's a component of a total fat threshold. And I'm like, but my fat went up and he's like, Oh, <laughs> Which is how that's it, like, I can't tell you how much respect I have for someone who's, he's been doing lipidology great, like longer than I've literally been alive. And the fact that he can still come to the table with an open mind and talk to a 20 something, like I have something to contribute, which I think I do. They, I think some people get in ego defense mode and think that diminishes them. In my opinion, it does the exact opposite. I can't have, you know, I've worked with very few mentors who are super engaged and open-minded throughout their career. And, you know, at, at the top of that hierarchy includes to give first hat tip to David Ludwig and then um, William Cromwell has been unbelievable. Um, I joke that um, if you look at the history of the LEM and the LMHR in, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be a time point. And that time point is going to be, there's going to be um, BC and BCE before Cromwell and uh, after Cromwell. <laughs> so um, he's our Lem Jesus. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, to, to some of the videos that you've done, Nick, that I was reviewing, a lot of lipidology is hey, we know, the, we know the foundation fairly well. That's kind of the, the, the concept out there, such that there isn't going to be something that'll disrupt that key foundation. It's really that we're filling in more of the gaps around this foundation. And I feel as though the lipid energy model may, may be a substantial disruptor uh, to a lot of that core lipidology as it's understood because, and we'll get a chance to get into this a little bit later, it could have implications on the category of exposure as a model. If indeed it turns out with the further caveat that we don't know for sure until we see a lot of data to potentially substantiate this, that uh, the metabolic context is relevant. Okay. One of, what's that? Nothing. Oh, one of the, uh, one of the challenges is that metabolism itself, or as much as it's constantly getting talked about, 
online and in the space of nutrition, et cetera, they're really, and I'm sure you see this, especially Nick, you see that there's kind of a lack of connect between how much metabolism specifically impacts lipid dynamics, specifically lipid profiles, et cetera. There's, there's not, um, and I, and I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. We should probably save that for our segment, but it's, it's extremely relevant when starting to walk down the road of this importance of looking at these lipid profiles and the association to the outcome of not just atherosclerosis, but disease itself, especially many diseases associated with metabolic um, dysfunction. Yeah. So actually let's uh, let's slowly start to transition to, to that conversation. Cause I'd really like to get into the nuances of lean mass hyper responder. I'd like to, first start out by actually talking about the lipid heart hypothesis and then transition into the LMHR and really tell a story of, of your data, like how your data is going to be impacting all this and then finishing things off by really getting into the nitty gritty of the mechanisms. I've actually written down a bunch of notes on potentials for mechanisms that could be pro uh, in favor of what your data has shown. And then some some mechanisms that I think uh, need to be elucidated based on the research that's already out there in favor of the the lipid heart hypothesis. So I'd, I'd love to get into that, but um, I don't know if if uh, Nick's going to be hanging out with with us for for that conversation. Of course, he's welcome to. But uh, if if not, um... you're muted, Nick. <laughs> I think I'll probably quietly fade into the background. I think this will be a better discussion if you two have a one-on-one -on -one and I uh, don't interject, which I'm going to be unable to not do if uh, I'm here. So I will listen to it after the fact. And thank you for having me on, Nick. This has been a fantastic discussion. And sure. I look forward to listening to the tail end with you too. Um, yeah. All right. Is there uh, is there anything you want to want to add before you leave? Like anything at all that that you have felt in other interviews or just other discussions that hasn't been you haven't gotten an opportunity to say? We play good cop bad cop. Me and Dave. Um, okay. I'm gonna put on my bad cop hat because I like to play that role a little bit. What I'm okay. gonna invite people to do is, if you wouldn't mind, Nick. I'm going to yeah. upload a video later today responding to Lane's recent video. And I'd like okay. them, if they've now spent an hour listening to you, to watch that and contrast him to you and just think about who's having the more productive discussion. Okay, uh, I will I will link it under, under this video. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> See ya. Okay, there was a lot there. And to make something abundantly clear, the takeaway is not that Oreo cookies are a health food or that they would reduce blood lipoproteins in everyone. They were simply used as an extreme example to get a point across. This highly likely does not translate to you. What it does offer, however, is an opening for the scientific community to discover a novel phenomenon that may have been lost in the data that we have up to now. It is a potential new frontier to learn more about lean mass hyperresponders and the effect on metabolic health on heart disease risk. This data does not speak to the risk of lipoproteins on heart disease, but that is what we will be getting into along with much more in the discussion with Dave, which is up next. And if you'd like to follow Nick and Dave's work, I'll have their links to some of their studies and their media information in the description box. Thank you to both of them for joining me. It was a lot of fun and thank you for listening.